Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final day of the 225th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and with me is uh, Alberto Conti of Northrop Grumman. Hi, Alberto. Hi, Tony. Good to see you again. Last day. How are you? Oh, man. I am tired. It's, it's been a long but a great meeting. And what, it's a, what I'm very excited about is we have with, you, with us today the president of the American Astronomical Society, Dr. Meg Urey, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about what, it's, what, her, what her responsibilities are at the AA. And as well as some of the research that she's doing, and uh, things like that. So we're going to we're going to uh, connect with her. Uh, but before I introduce her, let me uh, invite you to ask us questions and send us comments. There's a lot of ways you can do it. Uh, the best way probably is on the YouTube channel that we're broadcasting on uh, the on Hubble Site uh, channel. Leave your comments and questions there. We're also on the G Plus uh, event page, and you can tweet using the hashtag. Hubble Hangout. We're looking at all of these things, so we hope you'll have some questions for us, and we'll get to them uh, as we get uh, going through the through the broadcast. So with me today is Dr. Meg Yuri. Hi, hi, Meg. Hey. She's the uh, president of the American Astronomical Society. Tell us, what is that like? Uh, being president, you mean? Yes. Well, it's a lot of fun, I would say. Uh, uh, it's it's kind of a job at this meeting in in the sense that I go from seven in the morning till ten at night. I kind of approach it like a military campaign. You know, I have I have fixed times for rest and fixed times for action and so on. No, it's terrific, and, and it's wonderful to see this huge crowd here, and especially the huge number of young people and the exciting work they're doing. I mean, is it is it there are more younger people? You're oh saying? Oh God, yes. Uh, you know, when I was younger, first of all, the meetings were much smaller, but also they were skewed differently. I think we have so many undergraduates here and so many graduate students and postdocs, and you. You know, in my own field, if I just look in my own field, I see uh, I see uh, tons of projects being done that I, I may have once thought about, gee, that would be interesting if someone did that, but there wasn't the manpower. Now we've got a really vibrant community, a really active community. It's just fantastic what they're finding. And so uh, w putting together a meeting like this, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people uh, have to do a lot of things. Uh, you guys do meetings twice a year, right? You do one in the spring and one in the uh, winter. Which ones are the, are the biggest? Yeah, the winter meeting is by far the biggest. Um, it's usually, right now, I think it's running at 3,000 people or more. Uh, as compared to, you know, 600 when I was younger was a big meeting. And um, the summer meeting is a little bit smaller, and we also include a meeting in a meeting, a sort of specialized topical meeting within the larger meeting, or perhaps a division meeting within the larger meeting. Um, and that's a little more intimate feel. But uh, this meeting has t turned into just a super good uh, networking uh, opportunity and also an opportunity to learn a great deal in different about different things. For example, we've had a series of career workshops to uh, give people information about how to look for a job, especially outside academia. You know, professors are pretty good at telling you what to do uh, to get a job like theirs because we did it and we know other professors and we know universities, but we don't know the technical world as well. And so we're trying very hard at the AAS to improve our connection to uh, what I call industry, to astronomers in industry and to potential jobs in industry for people who have the fantastic training that astronomers have. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to just say that's something you have been pushing actually yeah, to yeah. do. And I think it's, it's, you know, being, I, w I was in a, one of those career panels you just mentioned. I think it's uh, very nice to see, first of all, how many people actually turn up because they realize that, you know, to some extent, you know, there are not that many jobs available out there, but also that, that you know, that careers are possible, you know, outside yeah. academia, which is very interesting. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to call you on something though. You said there aren't that many jobs available. What you, uh, no, you meant there aren't that many jobs basically, well, in academia, essentially, or the museum industry, perhaps. But when I, somebody said, someone said the other night at the career networking reception, great thing, 150 uh, stu uh, students, young people, uh, so on, organized by your committee, the employment committee, and, and Kelly Cruz. Um, somebody said to me afterwards, I'm so glad you said that about, you know, looking outside of academia, blah, 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 because they're just, we're training too many PhDs. And I said, that is not correct. We could train 10 times as many PhDs, and they would all be employed very, you know, their skills would be used in important areas. They would have challenging, interesting careers. So I think we just have to kind of, we all were brought up in that mindset, right, that a job meant a faculty job. It never, it was never the case that there were enough faculty jobs for every PhD. Uh, nor should it be. Not every graduate student at the end of their career, you know, they've thought about it and they understand what it means and they may or may not like the job of being a professor. We assume they'll love it because we love it, right? right? But they have, they're different people, you, you know, have different interests. So, so anyway, um, that's yeah. my rant on that. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, that's a good point. No, no, I agree. I was actually going to say that's actually perfectly 
Correct. And I think one of the things that I was trying to tell the folks when I was in the career panel was that among the most prepared people for the workforce, it's astronomers. You know, we have the skills that are problem solving. They can be put in front of a problem no one has ever looked at, and they systematically go through it. They have a systematic way of approaching, uh, you know, even life to some extent, and even problems in life. And so that's, so I agree that we are among the most prepared, you know, in the, in the field. And, and physicists as well. And, I, I, and, I've, talked, and I've talked to uh, many tenured professors and uh, about uh, when I was first starting out and when I was at the point of deciding to continue to graduate school or not, mm -hmm. uh, one of the professors told me, and, and I, I was in the same mindset, I've got to go to grad school, I've got to get a PhD, then I've got to do postdocs for a couple of years, and, and or f more than a couple these days it seems, and then hopefully get a, a professorship. And she said, many, I've gotten many pieces of advice, but the, the basic gist of it was these Professorships are extremely competitive, and maybe 5% of the people who apply for them actually maybe get them, right? Yeah. It's, they're, they're getting the, the tenured professor. 10%, but yeah. Oh, a little bit better, okay. Yeah. But a small percentage of the people who apply, it's extremely competitive and very hard. And, a lot, and one of the things that I remembered was, well, wait a minute. I, I went into this as a software engineer. I could get a job anywhere. I really yep. could, and I had no, and I was making more in a lot of sense, a lot of times, than the postdocs and the and the associate professors were making. So, this is an important point, I think that. So that's why sometimes when people ask me, should I pursue a PhD? My answer is always yes. Well, well sure, and I would have had my. Yeah. No, no, it's always this in the sense that it prepares you for almost any career, especially if you get a PhD in physics or astronomy. Right. right. It's strange that it's the STEM fields that we're holding to this standard of is there a professorship waiting for that person. You know, at my university, uh, people come to, I was chair of the physics department for six years, and people would come and say, well, you know, are, is there employment for physicists and so on? And, and the thing is, you know, we, we're graduating 30 physicists. Is that too much? History and English departments are graduating hundreds of people. And nobody is saying, are there professorships for every one of them? Certainly there aren't. So the point is to, first of all, do something you love. That is the most important thing. Do something that you really love because that's what you're going to be good at. And then second, um, you know, follow that love as far as you can. But then people should know that if you, if you have to take a turn in the path, let's say you desperately wanted to be a professor and it just didn't happen for whatever reason. I have to say in the last, you know, five, six years because of the economy, I think there was a particularly difficult moment you know, the searches were definitely low in the 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, uh, if you have to take a turn, I can promise you that every person I know who did that, who was trying to get a faculty job, did not get one, and did something else, uh, you know, six months later, I'm talking to them, they're, they're, they're happy. They, they are doing challenging, interesting work. It is just as independent as their, you know, their astronomical research work was, was uh uh, they have their control over their own work. Basically, they're given a question. My, one of my former postdocs uh, went to work for an agency that cannot be named and doing stuff he could not tell me about. But he did say um, that it was, uh, you know, they would give him a problem and they wouldn't tell him how to answer it or anything. He had to figure out where was the, where was the data, you know, what kind of data would answer this question, where is it, and, and then formulate basically experimental work to, to answer the question. So that is what we are trained to do, and and um, and it's a lot of fun. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, people should do follow their 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 thing. I'm curious. Not their professor's advisor thing. Right. <laughs> that's a good point. That's absolutely a great point. <laughs> I'm curious. Where do you think that comes from? This this mindset where that's where we ha what we have to do. Where do you think that starts? Do you guys oh, have any? I know. Oh, okay. Well, snobism. Oh really? Mm. Oh, okay. So would we, would we, if I'm 19 and I'm, I'm an undergrad and I'm starting my astronomy degree or my physics degree, whatever it happens to be, it starts there, and it's just in the it's just in the culture of. Well, let me be a little nicer about it. I think, I think to be fair, you know, professors are professors because they love teaching and they love research and they love interacting with students and with their community and so on. Um, and so we naturally, you know, I'm one, so we naturally think this is the best job in the world because we're doing it, right, right. right? But that's true pretty much of, well, it's not true. Of, yeah, maybe it's more true in STEM. I don't know. Anyway, it's true of a lot of jobs that people really love it and therefore they push it. So I don't blame faculty for being so professor focused. But I think more and more astronomy faculty and physics faculty are recognizing that we do train our students broadly. We could train them a little more broadly than we do perhaps uh, with a little business knowledge or something. But we train them quite broadly and they're ready for many things. And it's actually good for us and good for the research community if these people are seated out in companies like Northrop Grumman or you know SpaceX or Boeing here in Seattle or, or Amazon because then they're 
uh, you know, the, the, the more you mix people with different ideas, the better it is for... The better the science is. Exactly. The better the science is. So uh, the, the, uh, uh, one of the things that, that I've noticed also is that uh, a lot of astronomers are... There's, there's, when I talk to postdocs especially, there's a lot of stress in that track where you are... You know, there's a lot of expectation. You have to... You know, if you're a postdoc for more than two years, it's kind of a, a warning. A red flag goes up, right? Because and postdocs, by the way, I should I, I should explain. These are these sort of. Uh, how would you describe a postdoc? What what what, what is that? It's what. It, you, so you've graduated, you've got your PhD, and then you enter into this sort of realm of being a postdoc, where you work at places for pay. Yeah, happy. To, uh, you get your PhD, and it's uh, it's basically a hundred percent research job. Uh, and uh, you're typically, some of them are fellowships in astronomy. We're extraordinarily fortunate. We have of order a two dozen uh, fellowships that basically pay you to work for three years doing whatever you want. So you follow your research interests and you publish papers and make an impact on the science, learn new things. And, um, and it is a, a chance. One of the things I love about astronomy, and there are many, many advantages about it, but for young people, it's the best field in the world to go into. Um, and, and one of the reasons is that you have, there are many postdoc positions available. So pretty much everyone with a PhD can get a postdoc. Not every, you know, but pretty much. Uh, and then they have a chance to prove what they can do independently. Otherwise, it's reliant a lot on where, what university they were at. Did they have resources? To yeah. what advisor they have, were they given a good problem, you know, these kinds of things. So we allow people this, this period during which they show what they can do. And that period could be anywhere from a, a few years, as you said, two years, to it could be up to six years, I would say. Many people who are currently faculty did six years of postdoc uh, beforehand. And for some young people, that's a concern because typically you move uh, when you do postdocs. But again, Astronomy has the advantage we can do it anywhere and we can do it any time. A biologist has to be at the bench in the lab. A chemist, you know, has, has to do the same. Uh, they have living cells they're working on, which have time scales. You know, you maybe can't take a vacation because your, your cell culture is coming to fruition or whatever. Astronomers have this incredible flexibility. So I think it's, as, 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 uh, as postdocs go, we, we just have all, and we also get paid higher salaries as postdocs than almost any other uh, science field. So we are really, um, we, we launch our young people and say, go and, and, and sh you know, uh, show what you can do and enjoy yourself and, and decide if this is the life for you. So it's a chance to sort of show what you can do independently outside of your advisor or the academic environment you were trained in. Um, but the, the uh, and then the expectation though, is that sooner or later you're going from that into a, ten, into a professorship of some kind. So an alternative, let's say Alberto, you, since you're in industry, let's talk, I'll ask this to you. Uh, the, you know, what's the alternative? So I've got my PhD, I apply Northrop Grumman. What would Northrop Grumman do with someone who's recently oh. graduated? So uh, people might not know this, but we employ a lot of astronomers where we are, right? Yeah, I, and I, I was surprised when you went there. Yeah, there. actually, like, and, and the reason is very simple, exactly what you said, Meg, which is the fact that you put uh, engineers and astronomers in the same room, different ideas, different way to solve problems, different way to translate jargon from, let's say, I want a, you know, a star shade, I want a telescope that behaves like this, right. and this is because I want to do the science that I want to do and how does that translate in uh, in really building hardware because at some point this stuff has to be built right and so that uh, that translation if you will between the jargon in astrophysics uh, that, that defines the, the scientific requirements and the jargon in engineering that defines those requirements is a non-trivial is a non-trivial translation you know sometimes lots gets lost in translation to some extent right and so you need these teams that are very cohesive right uh, you know web you know the James Webb Space Telescope is a large team of 700 right. people in North right. Grumman but uh, people will be surprised there are lots and lots of astronomers that lead you know instrument teams that lead um, teams that develop you know uh, the, the sun shield for the, uh, the sun shield for example and the reason is specifically that they are the you know the, the link in between you know those very very important scientific requirements and how you actually build uh, this um, these instruments right and so without that uh, an engineer might cut off, uh, uh, you know, part of an instrument because uh, it doesn't meet mass requirement, doesn't meet this requirement, and thereby cutting 99% of the science, which is would be would make the observatory let's say completely useless, right? So it's a tremendous value that we add, and the reason why. Northrop hires a lot of engineers, but also a lot of astronomers, is exactly what you mentioned, which is this capability of being put in front of a problem that no one has solved before, a problem no one has seen before, a problem that has no solution, apparent solution, uh, and being able to sit down with engineer and say, this is my solution, this is what we should do, this is how we're going to work it out. 
And that is extremely powerful. I mean, I see it, uh, you know, I joined Northrop Grumman a year and a few months ago. I see that every day. It's actually, it's quite beautiful to see. It's quite beautiful to see when you sit down and you see these collaborat mm -hmm. collaborative efforts where uh, there's tension, there's screaming, there's uh, there's a uh, the scream because pe everybody cares, you know. Yeah, they yeah. they uh, and so that's an extremely yeah. There's there's very passion, and so it's uh, it's quite a beautiful thing to see actually. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I I've, I've noticed or I've I've have seen in in the uh, in the astronomy field is uh, like for example, let's say James Webb astronomer comes online and they 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 get to work on a specific project and and they would work at it for many many years before the thing is even launched, and then the thing gets launched and let's say you know so and they do some science with it. There seems to be a connection between astronomers, astronomers in a lot of fields and missions, right? I mean, there'll be, you know, a mission will launch because of, because of the time scales involved. Kepler, does, you know, a dozen years went by or so before it was launched and then it was launched, did its five year thing. That's a career, that's a whole career. Is that true also? I mean, one of the things Ron, um, what was Paladin. his name? Paladin, from, uh, we talked to him early. He's an astronomer in Northrop Grumman. He told us earlier this week that he's involved in all kinds of things. So he doesn't necessarily get wedded to one specific mission. And would you say that's another big difference between academia and, uh, and industry? Well, maybe, but, but perhaps not. I mean, some, some astronomers are focused on their particular mission or facility. For example, you know, to get a, a multi-million dollar, multi, in some cases a billion dollar project done, you have to be stubborn as hell and, and, and dogged and not, you know, not pushed from that. But there are many people who, who are uh, just doing the science part, not the mission planning or preparing part. And, and there, I think it, it's, um, it's changed a lot since when I was in, in training. Uh, you know, then you used to have X-ray astronomers and optical astronomers and infrared astronomers, or you might have someone who used CAC all the time and nothing else or whatever. Now people tend to uh, uh, be um, much broader. You know, they're, they're practitioners of the, uh, what they're focused on is the science, and then they look around to say, which of these experiments, which of these devices is going to answer the question I need answered uh, this month, okay? okay. So there's, really there's a subset of astronomers yeah, too. I was going to add. There's a correlate to that, which I think uh, uh, you're dead. You're dead right in a sense that uh, 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 over the last uh, maybe. 10, 20 years, the role of the archives in science has changed dramatically, right? So you can actually do uh, what you just described because... That, that would be, need to be in an academic environment, actually, right? No, that, that uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. This, this, this is another piece of why astronomy is a great field for young people, okay? In some fields, you have to be given permission by your advisor or your employer, you know, you can write a paper on this, and, and that's unusual in many, in many subdisciplines. In astronomy, any person can go online and find data that's interesting and that people have not yet exploited and that can uh, you know, turn into a result that's a paper. You can write as an individual, you can write a paper at any moment. That's that right. Even amateurs can do that. Incredible. Yeah, even amateurs can do that. So, so I think that's a, test, that, that's a testament to the success of two things, I think. One is uh, these general purpose observatories like Hubble, for example, that allow these data to be distributed to the worldwide community, really, right. not just the astronomical community for free. And then uh, the, the repository, all the archives, you know, that allow you to access that data. I mean, anybody, you know, you know this, the Hubble Legacy Archive, everything else, people can access the same data I will, you know, if I want to do my research. And that's extremely empowering. Yeah, I have to say, that came from the space side. And Hubble, you know, in particular, helped build this up. Uh, but, uh, but it's now percolated into the ground-based side. Archiving is expensive. Uh, it's not easy uh, to make data stay current over many decades. But uh, the ground-based observatories are now taking it on because they see what happens when you make this data usable to many more people. You get much more out of it. And it's, you know, we put a big investment into these facilities, and so getting a bigger return is really important. That's right. And one of the things that, well, one of the three things the Institute is, is charged with, not only is operating Hubble and James Webb, but also to distribute and, ar and archive all, a lot of data for a lot of missions. So anybody who wants Hubble data, and we talked about this yesterday in our Hangout, if you want Hubble data, if you want Kepler data, you can get the same data that, that everybody else is using uh, with, the, with the only uh, qualification is that sometimes data are, um, uh, what is it, embargoed, embargoed for about a year uh, so that astronomers who've taken the data, who've paid for the data can, can get their results out then, and then they'll make it available to everybody. Uh, any time, so that's an, that, that's an that's an important point. Um, so I've noticed. So I can I've always 
describe myself when people ask me what I do as an astronomical programmer. And that's not a statement on how good I am. It's a statement of, <laughs> uh, of w the kind of programming I've done. I've specialized in writing code for people to get astronomy science done. And that's manipulating the data, downloading the data, uh, storing it, whatever it is. And I've noticed over my 30 years of doing this that there are a lot more, there seems to me anyway, a lot more younger astronomers who are women in the field. Has that been your experience? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, 25 years ago, I could go to a meeting like this. Of course, they were smaller, and I would know all five women who were there. <laughs> You're right. And, and so I, I, it just seems like this become more, uh, more open for, for women. Did you wanna yeah, no, I want to ask you a question, actually, because, I mean, so how – so you've seen change. I think we all see changes. But so what do you think the biggest change that you've seen over the past, you know, 20 years? I mean, you are – uh, you know, you're head of a very, very, you know, you're at Yale, so it's a very, very uh, important uh, department. I mean, uh, you are a very a prominent figure, you know, you're the head of the AAS. But uh, so not only what kind of advice you would give, you know, to, to young women starting, but how, what is the biggest thing you've seen change in for women minority in general over the last maybe 20 years, right? Yeah. Boy, you got me started now on my favorite topic. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I'll tell you, first I'll tell you a short story. We had a, a reception for past presidents on Tuesday, and uh there were five women there and, w and one man, D David Helfand, the, the, the past president. And we were all sort of looking around going, wow, we wouldn't have thought about this 20 years ago. Um, uh, I will say it was all white women and white people. And I think white women have made a, you know, very good progress. Um, it may be that we're at a tipping point. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. But I think um, as far as we can see, women are now about half of majors and graduate students. And, and the evidence seems to suggest they're propagating through to Again, we're tracking only faculty positions, not outside a academia, but, uh, but they seem to be tracking through to those positions just fine. How did that happen? Well, I'll tell you, it did not happen by itself. You know, it was not a matter of saying we're in the modern day, you know, therefore let there be equality. Um, and in fact, it's very interesting to compare astronomy and physics. Uh, they both have the same skill set. And by the way, I'm in a physics department at Yale. We have a separate astronomy department and lots of cross appointments, of, of which I have one. But uh, the cultures in the two areas are very different. I think physics is much more serious. I mean, I really don't know that there would have been physicists dancing uh, until 1 in the morning uh, at one of their meetings, you know. Uh, Unless I discovered the Higgs boson or something, they were super happy, right? <laughs> yes. Perhaps that. And, and at least not with any rhythm. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know the old joke about what? How do you know an extroverted physicist? No. He's looking at your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, okay. I'm going to stop picking on physicists. There are plenty of really uh, enthusiastic, uh, friendly, fun physicists. But uh, I'm just saying that something is different between the two fields. It has nothing to do with ability. It's nothing to do with aptitude, nothing to do with interest. And we see, but we see a different demographic. There are many more, that historically, over the last 50 years, uh, the percentage of astronomers who are women has been roughly double the percentage of physicists who are women. So that's really interesting to see. And the two fields have taken different tracks. As I say, I've got one foot in each. In astronomy, we tried, we, we were sort of desperate, I would say, <laughs> when I was at Space Telescope and there were so few women. You know, there's an institute that was started in 1981 and then did, did its biggest hiring in the mid-80s and, and after. Uh, and, it's, and at the time, women were getting about 15% of the PhDs in astronomy. And yet, when I went there as a postdoc, only one of the 60 or so PhDs on the faculty track were women. So that's crazy, right? So we held a meeting called the uh, uh, Women in Astronomy uh, Conference in Baltimore. We wrote something called the Baltimore Charter. But I think what, which we, tr we brought to the AAS and they endorsed its goals and so, so on. But I think the thing that made the biggest difference was to get 150 women astronomers in the same room in 1992 in Baltimore. And we all kind of looked around and said, oh, you know, wow, there's a whole lot of us, whereas we'd all been feeling very isolated. And I, I still say uh, today to young women in particular, if, if, uh, if you're in one of these fields that are heavily male-dominated, whatever it is, the best thing you can do to keep yourself sane and moving along is to network with other women. And I think, uh, and in I had a nice conversation with one of our members uh, last night who was pointing out that it's also very important to find role models not who match you not just in gender but also in ethnicity or race and and uh, you know it's great that white women are doing well uh, it's a big change from 25 years ago but we haven't seen the needle move on women of color and so uh, we really have to do better on underrepresented minorities I wonder I wonder if that's a I mean are they is it, is it a um, 
educational thing or they're just not going they're just not choosing that field or um it's it's i believe it's it's sort of an unstable feedback here we are you know sorry getting nerdy but um when you're so few okay you 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 are by definition isolated wherever you are and then you you spend a tremendous amount of your energy sort of establishing a force field you know kind of like the old star trek thing you spend all your fuel trying to keep this force field to 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 repel the judgments and the slurs and things that happen um, and I have to say this this was the case also this is how I felt 25 years ago as a woman but as I say things have improved a lot for me I mean look at me I'm president of the AAS there are five four these four women were presidents before me and, and others as well so you know today I don't feel like I need my force field but I certainly did when I was isolated and I think that's the case for most minorities today I have to uh, sh give a shout out to there are a number of fantastic programs and they've been highlighted here at our meeting and posters and sessions and so on to, to um, address exactly this, to give uh, people who are minorities in their field for whatever reason, give them a community and motivation and information to help them stay in. Not that I think everybody has to stay in astronomy who's trained in astronomy, but people should be able to do what they want to do and not be discouraged from it or pushed out of it because it looks like they don't belong. So is the AAS doing anything specific to help that out, or is it just a just a general, I mean, are you doing any public awareness things or anything? Else? Absolutely. So first of all, we have three uh, diversity committees, okay. Committee on the Status of Women in Astronomy, the Committee on the Status of Minorities in Astronomy, and WIGLI, which is the Working Group for LGBT Equality. Okay. And I named those in the, in the order they were founded. Um, uh, uh, CSWA is the oldest one, and I would say they're, you know, they're now running like a smoothly oiled machine, but it took... 20, 30 years to get there. CSMA is coming along, and Wigley's brand new. We're really excited about them uh, having, they put together a best practices brochure, which is available at the meeting. Uh, there's a little Wigley pin, which I took off my name tag, but it's on my name tag. Um, uh, and I think that's fabulous. They've been they've been uh, networking for years at our meetings. They've, they always have a Monday night dinner, to which I've gone to a few of them. Yeah, there's the Wigley pin, okay. Rainbow and, and, and Wiggly, how, how it's pronounced, Wiggly. It is really cool, isn't it? So, um, so uh, I have every expectation that they will help uh, that community. That doesn't mean we've done, you know, we've done everything we can. And we, sorry, the other thing I was saying is at our meetings, we have many sessions that are, last night there was a packed session on the imposter syndrome that Jessica Kirkpatrick put together. Um, I was, unfortunately, I needed to be in a different session and then somewhere else, but I was watching it on the Twitter feed. Uh -huh. And it, uh, it was wonderful, and I tried to get to the end of it, and I just passed all these people who, I, I missed the end of it, they, it was over, and people were coming out, and they were all smiling and talking, and you could see that it had really boosted, boosted them, you know, made them feel like, hey, maybe I can do this, I'm not the only one here who feels like they're not, um, you know, not up to snuff or whatever. So I think we can make a big difference like that. Uh, with those activities. Yeah. Sorry, so I, will, I was going to ask you this question now. So I am a young female or minority. Uh, I'm finishing my PhD maybe, right? And maybe I do want to go into astronomy and career. So what, what kind of advice would you give to him or her, right, in, in, in this part of their, their career? You know, what is the best advice you can give her? Can, I, I can hold the thought for 10 seconds and you may have to remind me of it. I just want to also mention that there are communities we haven't yet explicitly addressed that, that may feel they're getting left out. And we, uh, we, the AAS operates on volunteer talent, so we're always looking for people to come and help. But I was thinking in particular of trans individuals, because that's a topic that isn't discussed as much, and it's not as, it, you know, in some way maybe people feel strange about discussing it. Um, I have a daughter who's very into this community. She's educating me, so it's a little easier. But, you know, we got to get used to it. And, and we have members who are tra trans individuals, and we need to make them feel safe. Those are... The, the more, you know, the more you can tick off uh, gender, uh, um, uh, ethnic status, uh, uh, gender expression, you know, the more of these things that you as an individual have, sort of the more barriers you might face. So we have to make sure we, we and we're, de you know, the fact that we have three committees doesn't mean we're not looking at everything and that we're trying to do, trying to do more. So back to your oh, question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what was your question? I told you I'd forget. Yeah, that's okay. So, <laughs> what what so, so uh, okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm graduating, I'm a young woman. Young yeah, woman, yeah. Lady. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would start by asking questions like, what are you enjoying? What do you think is good? What would you like to do? But, but if I'm talking to someone who really enjoys research and had always planned to do, okay, I'm speaking to you, the person I spoke to yesterday, okay? Uh, this is a person who's done very well. She's the first in her family to go to college, first in her family to get a PhD. Well, she's still in graduate school. 
Um, she's very interested in astronomy, you know, really likes the field. But she's decided to leave astronomy because she doesn't see anyone ahead of her who's her, who looks like her. Um, she is worried about having to be a transient postdoc for a couple of years if she wants to start a family. And, um, and she's just worried about the probability of getting a faculty job and getting tenure and all these things. And, and there, I have to tell you, I pushed back on her pretty hard. You know, we started this conversation with me saying, I, I think it's great people go into indus industry or education and outreach or the, or the planetary museum community. All that stuff is fabulous. But I, I want the reason to be because that's what you want to do, not because you think you can't succeed at this thing that you want. You don't see anybody like you doing that. Yeah, so I have to tell you, I mean, I, I know I'm not outing her because nobody, you guys don't know who I'm talking about, but... Um, I really, I really was. I probably gave her far too hard a time, but I, you know, I, I, I introduced her to several people who employ uh, senior women uh, in astronomy of her uh, background, and and so I just want her to at least give it a chance to talk to people who are ahead of her in the pipeline. You know, there may have been a day when there wasn't anybody. Uh, but then Margaret Burbage came along, and, and Cecilia Payne Kapashkin before her. You know, there. The white women have had a few models for a long time, but there are people out there. And I always think of Vera Rubin, too. Vera, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, in fact, this may be why astronomy does a little better than physics, at least to start, because there were women who were visible, Carolyn Herschel and, 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 and so on. And actually, computer science, your field, you know, Ada Lovelace and, and Grace Hopper and, and everything. So um, I think they should give it, you know, they sh but I go back to the point I made. It's important to network and to find role models to sort of take care of your emotional side of the profession. Um, the, the, the white men are handling the, the, what they handle is the stresses of being an astronomer and will my research project turn into a paper and you know all these things. They're handling that just as the, just as the women are. But the uh, women and the minorities and of whatever stripe uh, uh, are also handling a lot of doubt. You know, do I belong here? Is this gonna work? And that doubt comes directly from the lack of visible uh, people who've visibly succeeded in front of them. So we have to give them support and um, including supporting them if they want to stop doing it. I have no problem with that. But I want to make sure it's, it's for the reason that, that you decided it's not for you, not because you think others have decided it's not yeah. for you. I was going to ask you a, a corollary to that, a follow-up to that, if you will. So you're a Yale astronomer, you, you have a blog on CNN, you write about diversity, uh, you are the head of the AAS, uh, so you never see your family, I assume, or via Skype maybe or something. But so how do, you manage, how do you manage your family life? Well, that's a good question. Well, first of all, let me just say for the people who are, are younger and don't know where I came from, I had a very rocky path to where I am today, which looks, you know, looks highly successful. Even I... If, when I hear you say that, I think, wow, that's pretty good. Okay. Um, I do a lot of stuff. It's good, but I didn't mean, actually, I ask exactly because of that, because usually the path is, is not smooth. It's never smooth, right? But I'll tell you, when I was younger, I didn't have any expectation. I wanted to be a professor, but I didn't have any expectation of success. I, I just thought, well, I'm just going to keep doing this as long as someone's willing to pay me to be a postdoc or whatever. And also I thought, and this is different from how young women think about this today, um, and it's very different from how young men think. I thought... You know, women should have the right to work, and women should have the right to have children. There shouldn't be any conflict between it, and I'm just going to do it. And if, if, it's, if it's difficult, um, you know, I'm going to make things change so that it's not. So I wasn't thoroughly successful in that. But now what I tell people is if you want to be uh, a mother and have an intellectual uh, life in a, some way, um, just go ahead and do it. I actually think academics have an easier time having families than people who work in lower paid, uh, less flexible jobs. Like, you know, if you work at Walmart, there's plenty of women working at Walmart who have children. Oh, I agree. And that's a good point. But what about industry? Does industry look at that the same way? I mean, if you're at a university, I agree. It, it is much easier to, to balance family and, and uh, work. That's a that's a very good question. I think it's a little harder because I think uh, <clears throat> um, the tempo, if you will, in industry is a little right. shorter, right? Yeah. So things don't happen on months to years like they might happen in astronomy. They happen on days and weeks. So uh, I don't know. I'm a little older now, so my family is all gone. So uh, uh, in a sense that. The space telescope was very fast paced. We had deliverables, right, every day. And we had, so it was not like a university department where you could wait till tomorrow. And um, at, when I had my first kid, uh, I waited till I got a tenure track job and then I just got pregnant and right away on purpose. And um, I, there was no 
uh, no fam no maternity leave. I had to take disability. Okay, for the second kid there was there was maternity leave. So I took disability to have a child, if you can imagine. There was no lactation room. Um, I didn't need one because I had my own office, but lots of people at the institute were having babies and they didn't have anywhere to, to pump milk. So I asked the, our HR person at the time, uh, I won't tell you her, her name, but I asked her, not the one who's there now, who's fabulous, Cheryl, you're fabulous. Um, uh, I asked her if we could have a, a, a lactation room for women who are nursing. And, and she said, oh, we can't do anything for women that we don't do for men. So I said, well, that's fine. You know, if men want to use it for lactation, that's fine too, you know. Um, <laughs> But she didn't think that was funny and we didn't have one. But there is one now. There is a lactation room at STSEI now. And so it's, I found it not easy. It's not easy having kids, right? You're tired and so on. But, but, right? but I think uh, over the last, I've seen it myself. I've been in the U.S. for 20 years now. Uh, the things have changed quite dramatically. I mean, the way the, the, there's a support structure. And I was actually, you know, even, even, even if I don't make use of those facilities, North Grumman, I was very, very impressed with the kind of uh, support that they give to women. I have, you know, my former boss, Blake Bullock, has two, uh, uh, two very small children. And uh, uh, the, the support structure around these companies now is growing just because perhaps there's, there's more diversity, perhaps there's, uh, there's more of an understanding that, you know, that having a family is a normal thing that you go through life. And so there's, there, there has to be support structure around it. Right. It's actually very nice to see. It's very nice to see. You know, a place like Northrop Grumman and uh, universities, they don't want to lose the talent uh, that they could have just for logistical reasons like this. In my, when I was chair of the physics department, um, well, we have uh, five women now. Two of us, myself and another woman, uh, came to Yale with children, so with two small children. Um, but the three other women have had six children among them, and two of those women, w while assistant professors at Yale, and two of those women have already gotten tenure, and the third is doing extremely well. Um, so, you know, it's perfectly possible. And I'll point out also that um, because we have uh, parental leave, uh, uh, semester relief, and we also have a stop the clock option and so on. I'll also point out that there were five, I think, five young men who had a comparable number of children over the same period in our department as well. That doesn't get talked about as much. You know, people are saying, oh, those women had children, you know, whatever. But uh, the guys are doing it too, and they're taking advantage of these rules. And that brings up a point that I often make. Um, making things better for women or for minorities inevitably improves the workplace for everybody. And you get more pro productivity from people and less, less angst. So, Megan, let me just uh, let me just follow up with uh, so these different groups that you're talking about, and the things that the AAAS are trying to uh, uh, address and help people with. Uh, where is there? Is it all of it? Are there? Is there information on the website? Are there places people can go to find out more about these sure, committees yeah. you were talking about? Yeah, we have a lot of information on the website. Um, and AAAS.org. AAAS.org. And if you, uh, I think uh, for this kind of topic, diversity and so on, you'd want to look under committees and look for those three committees I mentioned. I also want to highlight the Committee on Employment, which is looking at these career issues we talked about. Um, and they have some very good materials and links to good materials for, for people. I send non-astronomers to that yeah. because I think astronomy has some of the best information out there about, for example, if you want to retool your career to work in industry using your, say, computing skills or mathematical skills, I would say astronomers have far better information on the web uh, than almost anybody. Yeah, one of the advice I've always given people is that they, they, they want to work in astronomy, but they're like, say, have a hard time with math or whatever and I always say look there's a lot of other things you can do working in astronomy is a big is a big statement you can do a lots of things if you know how to program a computer or build an instrument you're gonna get hired I mean there are people yeah. who need <laughs> engineers and people who can build things there's lots of things in astronomy that one can do so um, that's what's one thing I've always wanted to remind people there's a lots of other things besides just being an astronomer that you can do to work in astronomy um, okay the unemployment rate for for astronomers and physicists PhDs is z near zero right I mean it's just uh, well I've always said we are now in, in, in and I'm not uh, I'm not overstating it we are in the golden age of astronomy right now we are doing things in we are learning things about the universe that before it just blows my mind there's not a better time to no, ever study so, the universe. So, so at the turn of the uh, the late 1900s, okay, th there was a there was a sense that physics had reached its end. I know we we've right. learned everything there was to know. We learned everything there was to know, and then we got in within a period of a few years radioactivity, yeah. you know, quantum mechanics, relativity. At the end of the 19 of the 19 sorry 1990s, that's, I should have said 1890s before. Sorry, 1990s. I've lost my my century. Uh, uh, at the end of the 1990s, I think you. 
you were almost getting there with, with astronomy, right? The, the experiment that discovered, the two experiments that discovered dark energy were basically just trying to find out how much mass was in the universe, and then cosmology was done. That's right. right? That's right. They, were, they, they were trying to, they were measuring the deceleration of the yeah, universe. Yeah, and in the last, you know, the last half of the decade, we found exoplanets, we found dark energy, we've got far better measurements now of dark matter. I mean, it is an incredible period. I have to say, all of us who are older in the field, uh, we were just lucky. I mean, none of us saw this coming. But that's kind of the nature of astronomy. You know, unlike condensed matter physics, where you go into the laboratory and you build your experiment, we have, our experiment is the heavens. And, and, uh, and we have to be very clever about how we design an experiment to utilize the information that is there. And it's, therefore, it's much more of a discovery science than I think all of, all of science is discovery based, but astronomy a little more so. so I was going to ask you the question, I, maybe one of the last questions, but you know, so what does make you tick in, in astronomy? You know, what do you do on your regular basis? What do you teach and what do you enjoy doing and uh, what makes you tick? Yeah, what's your research interest? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I work on supermassive black holes. Um, I have for a long time. I was trained as an X ray astronomer and then I did some UV astronomy as well as a grad student. And then I sort of became a multi wavelength astronomer. And it turns out that you have to be. You know, um, okay, supermassive black holes are the center of every galaxy, and they can't have been born at 10 to the 8 solar masses, so they had to grow. And when and where they grew, uh, you know, how that evolution happened and what impact it had on the galaxy around it is something we don't know all that well, okay? We certainly didn't say about 15 years ago. And um, optical astronomers have been finding uh, these supermassive black holes for a long time because when matter falls onto them, they glow, the region outside them glows quite brightly. And if you look in the optical, you see rust frame UV emission from the accretion disk. But it turns out, I suspected, and a number of X-ray astronomers suspected, uh, that there should be a larger number of black holes that were hidden behind a shroud of, glass, of uh, gas and dust that absorbs the optical UV light. And by looking in X-rays, we could find those objects that the optical couldn't see. And so that's what I started doing around 2000, just before I left Space Telescope. We designed this goods survey, which has been very successful, the sort of the pioneer of the very multi-wavelength, um, everything you want, all wanted to know about AGN, sorry, active galactic nuclei and, and, and uh, galaxies. And then through that, through this sort of looking at uh, the growth of black holes, I'm also got very interested in galaxy evolution, which is funny because I never took an astronomy class. and. Um, <laughs> And in fact, one of uh, my most recent papers was written by my former postdoc, Kevin Schwinski, really interesting paper on how AGN feedback, uh, uh, commonly, uh, which theorists commonly use to explain why we don't have massive, super, super big galaxies, um, isn't ha doesn't seem to be happening in most galaxies, at least locally. Um, and, uh, you know, a number, yeah, so it's really interesting time to be doing this work because you have all the people interested in galaxy evolution. We are, we've got a great handle on when the black holes grew. There's one missing piece, which my postdoc, Steph Lamassa, is leading, uh, is a survey in x-rays to, to sort of match the, s the volume of, s of a restricted part of the Sloan survey mm -hmm. to find uh, whether there are very luminous uh, quasars that are shrouded. There is no, exp no data yet that taps that population. Wait a minute, luminous quasars that are shrouded. That, shrouded. Would, that would be a hard thing to do, it would seem well, to me theorists, like. Theorists think that's how they form, right? That the, the big idea in theory is that you have two galaxies merge, and there's a lot of dust and a lot of star formation, and so it's actually quite a dusty, nasty environment. Right. And then that the two black holes that were in those galaxies probably merge, and they accrete, and you know, eventually the, that, that quasar will blow away the gas and dust. But it, when it's born, it should be quite enshrouded. And yet we couldn't have found those because we need a large volume x-ray survey, which we haven't had till we, so we're doing that now at Yale. Okay, great. So, uh, and as a, I guess as a plug for JWST, they're going to be looking at some of the early galaxies, uh, and you'll get some in information there also on the, on yep. maybe galaxy ev evolution yep. that way. Yep, and on the black holes inside them as well. I, I can't wait for JWST. It's going to be fantastic. None of us can. I think none of us can. Yeah, a lot of us are pretty. 2018 seems so far away. But at least we're getting there. So, um, Elena, let me ask you, are, do we have any questions on, uh, on online? Okay. All right. Well, I guess, do you have any, anything, any, any, any follow-ups? Well, I think we want well, to thank you. you. It was extremely interesting to do this, and uh, we learned actually a lot because you, you're it's very busy, Meg. <laughs> yes, I want to thank you so much for taking time out to talk with us. This has been a lot of fun, and, and this will be posted on YouTube, and, we'll hope, and we, uh, we hope you guys will, will, will uh, give us feedback and let us know what you think. And, uh, and come be a member of the AAS. It has lots of benefits, and it's a really great organization. Oh, I know. I tell you, as a member, I get these. One of the things I always liked was the job register they send out at the beginning of every month. 
tons of jobs out there. So, and and you should see the the, the people like LSST is like you know, come work for us. So lots lots of people, lots of jobs. So anyway, thank you very much, Meg. It's thank wonderful you to it's thank really you. So, yes. To you. All right. Uh, well, that's it for this time. Uh, we'll be back at three thirty. Where we'll be talking with. Uh, we'll be start. We'll be kicking off the twenty uh, fifth anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and so I hope you'll join us uh, with Carol Christian and I. will be in our in our booth in uh, three thirty. So thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up to uh, what I call industry, to astronomers in industry and to potential jobs in industry for people who have the fantastic training that astronomers have. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I was going to just say that's something you have been pushing, actually, yeah, if, yeah. to do. And I think it's, it's, you know, being, I, I was in a, one of those career panels you just mentioned. I think it's uh, very nice to see, first of all, how many people actually turn up because they realize that, you know, to some extent, you know, there are not that many jobs available out there, but also that, that you know, that careers are possible, you know, outside academia, yeah. which is very interesting. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to call you on something, though. You said there aren't that many jobs available. What you, uh, no, you meant there aren't that many jobs basically, well, in academia, essentially, or the museum industry, perhaps. But when I, somebody said, someone said the other night, at the career networking reception, great thing, 150 uh, stu uh, students, young people, uh, so on, organized by your committee, the employment committee, and, and Kelly Cruz. Um, somebody said to me afterwards, I'm so glad you said that about, you know, looking outside of academia, blah, 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 because they're just, we're training too many PhDs. And I said, that is not correct. We could train 10 times as many PhDs, and they would all be employed very, you know, their skills would be used in important areas. They would have challenging, interesting careers. So I think we just have to kind of, we all were brought up in that mindset, right, that a job meant a faculty job. It never, it was never the case that there were enough faculty jobs for every PhD. Uh, nor should it be. Not every graduate student at the end of their career, you know, they've thought about it and they understand what it means and they may or may not like the job of being a professor. We assume they'll love it because we love it, right? right? But they have, they're different people, you, you know, who have different interests. So, so anyway, um, that's... Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final day of the 225th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and with me is uh, Alberto Conti of Northrop Grumman. Hi, Alberto. Hi, Tony. Good to see you again. Last day. How are you? Oh, man. I am tired. It's, it's been a long, but a great meeting. And what, it's a, what I'm very excited about is we have with, you, with us today uh, the president of the American Astronomical Society, Dr. Meg Urie, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about what, it's, what, her, what her responsibilities are at the AA and as well as some of the research that she's doing and uh, things like that. So we're going to we're going to uh, connect with her. Uh, but before I introduce her, let me uh, invite you to ask us questions and send us comments. There's a lot of ways you can do it. Uh, the best way probably is on the YouTube channel that we're broadcasting on uh, the on Hubble site uh, channel. Leave your comments and questions there. We're also on the G Plus uh, event page, and you can tweet using the hashtag Hubble Hangout. We're looking at all of these things, so we hope you'll have some questions for us, and we'll get to them uh, as we get uh, going through the through the broadcast. So with me today is Dr. Meg Yuri. Hi, hi, Meg. Hey. She's the uh, president of the American Astronomical Society. Tell us, what is that like? Uh, being president, you mean? Yes. Well, it's a lot of fun, I would say. Uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a job at this meeting in, in the sense that I go from 7 in the morning till 10 at night. I kind of approach it like a military campaign. You know, I have, I have fixed times for rest and fixed times for action and so on. No, it's terrific. And, and it's wonderful to see this huge crowd here and especially the huge number of young people. And yeah. I rant on that. Yeah, no, no, that's a good point. <laughs> no, no, I agree. I was actually going to say that's actually perfectly correct. And I think one of the things that I was trying to tell the folks when I was in the career panel was that among the most prepared people for the workforce, it's astronomers. You know, we have these skills that are problem solving. They can be put in front of a problem no one has ever looked at, and they systematically go through it. Yeah. They have a systematic way of approaching, uh, you know, even life to some extent, and even problems in life. And so that's so. I agree that we are among the most prepared, you know, in the in the field. And, and physicists as well. And, and, I, I, and I've talked and I've talked to uh, many tenured professors and uh, about uh, when I was first starting out, and when I was at the point of deciding to continue to graduate school or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the professors told me, and, and I, I was in the same mindset, I've got to go to grad school, I've got to get a PhD, then I've got to do postdocs for a couple of years, and, and, or f more than a couple these days, it seems, and then hopefully get uh, a professorship. And she said, many, I've gotten many pieces of advice, but the, the basic gist of it was, these 
professorships are extremely competitive, and maybe 5% of the people who apply for them actually maybe get them, right? Yeah. It's, they're, they're getting the, the tenured it's professor. It's 10%, but yeah. Oh, it was a little bit better, okay. Yeah. But a small percentage of the people who apply, it's extremely competitive and very hard. And, a lot, and one of the things that I remembered was, well, wait a minute. I, I went into this as a software engineer. I could get a job anywhere. I really yep. could, and I had no, and I was making more in a lot of sense, a lot of times, than the postdocs and the and the associate professors were making. So, this is an important point, I think. That so that's why sometimes when people ask me, should I pursue a PhD? My answer is always yes. Well, sure, and I would have had my. Yeah, no, no, it's always yes in the sense that it prepares you for almost any career, especially if you get a PhD in physics or astronomy. Right. right. It's strange that it's the STEM fields that we're holding to this standard of is there a professorship waiting for that person? You know, at my university, uh, people come to, I was chair of the physics department for six years, and people would come and say, well, you know, are, is there employment for physicists and so on? And, and the thing is, you know, we, we're graduating 30 physicists. Is that too much? History and English departments are graduating hundreds of people. And nobody is saying, are there professorships for every one of them? Certainly there aren't. So the point is to, first of all, do something you love. That is the most important thing. Do something that you really love because that's what you're going to be good at. And then second, um, you know, follow that love as far as you can. But then people should know that if you, if you have to take a turn in the path, let's say you desperately wanted to be a professor and it just didn't happen for whatever reason. I have to say in the last, you know, five, six years because of the economy, I think there was a particularly difficult moment you know, the searches were definitely low in the 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, uh, if you have to take a turn, I can promise you that every person I know who did that, who was trying to get a faculty job, did not get one, and did something else, uh, you know, six months later, I'm talking to them, they're, they're, they're happy. They, they are doing challenging, interesting work. It is just as independent as their, you know, their astronomical research work was, was uh, uh, they have their control over their own work. Basically, they're given a question. My, one of my former postdocs uh, went to work for an agency that cannot be named. The exciting work they're doing. I mean, is it? Is it? Did, there are more younger people. You're oh saying? Oh God, yes. Uh, you know, when I was younger, first of all, the meetings were much smaller, but also they were skewed differently. I think we have so many undergraduates here and so many graduate students and postdocs, and you, you know, in my own field, if I just look in my own field, I see, uh, I see uh, tons of projects being done that I, I may have once thought about gee, that would be interesting if someone did that, but there wasn't the manpower. Now we've got a really vibrant community, a really active community. It's just fantastic what they're finding. And so uh, w putting together a meeting like this, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people uh, have to do a lot of things. Uh, you guys do meetings twice a year, right? You do one in the spring and one in the uh, winter. Which ones are the, are the biggest? Yeah, the winter meeting is by far the biggest. Um, it's usually, right now, I think it's running at 3,000 people or more. Uh, as compared to, you know, 600 when I was younger was a big meeting. And um, the summer meeting is a little bit smaller, and we also include a meeting in a meeting, a sort of specialized topical meeting within the larger meeting, or perhaps a division meeting within the larger meeting. Um, and that's a little more intimate feel. But uh, this meeting has t turned into just a super good uh, networking uh, opportunity and also an opportunity to learn a great deal in different about different things. For example, we've had a series of career workshops to uh, give people information about how to look for a job, especially outside academia. You know, professors are pretty good at telling you what to do uh, to get a job like theirs because we did it and we know other professors and we know universities, but we don't know the technical world as well. And so we're trying very hard at the AAS to improve our connection 